Here on the stage, I have the pleasure of presenting Neil Stevenson from Hazelcast, and he will talk to you about uh, cloud storage. And uh, of course, in 35 minutes after the session is over, you can catch him on the Heap, uh, Heap uh, Space booth uh, just outside this blue room. So, Neil, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you. Do I have sound? I have sound. And video. Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Neil Stevenson from Hazelcast. I've come today to talk about scaling data in the cloud. Um, it's a two-part talk, scaling data and what the cloud adds to it. At the top of all my slides, um, there's a URL. Anybody that has a, a browser with them can go to that URL and participate in today's demo. So today's data is financial for no particular reason um, other than I could get hold of some data. So what I have is time series data. I have the price of gold today, the price of gold yesterday, the price of gold the day before. The same for silver, the same for platinum, the same for palladium. Uh, and I stopped there because um, this is data that people actually work with. Um, I'm based out of London and financial services people are interested in precious metals trading. So they want to do certain things uh, based on that data. They want to analyze it. So if we regard that data as time series, we've got a selection of points with timestamps. It's as simple as that. Might be every day, might be every minute. Doesn't matter too much. We want to store that data. We want to process that data. That's big data. We might keep the price of gold every minute going back 100 years. Who knows? We might keep the prices of all sorts of things. So we've got a lot of data we want to store. Uh, potentially, that becomes a bottleneck for processing. If it's all in the one place, how do you process that efficiently, fast, without huge numbers of CPUs that cost money? Uh, time for a little picture. Um, to the right is, it's actually Bitcoin, but it doesn't matter. This is things that people genuinely do. Um, so the price of Bitcoin goes up and then up and up and then down and whatever. So what people try to do is to predict the price. So they do things like averages and looking at that time series. So they have a way of slicing that data and saying, well, let's just look at Bitcoin over the last 10 minutes. Is the price trending up? Is it trending down? Um, if you see over to the right, there's a cross. So one of the trends is up, one of the trends is down. That's called the death cross. If you're a trader, that's good news because the price is moving and you know it's turned a corner. Uh, the other way is called the golden cross. That's still good news. The price is changing. So that's the thing people want to do with the data. They want to analyze it, and they need to analyze that quickly. If you think the price is going down, you want to do something about that quickly. You want to be ahead of the game. So speed is important, data volume is important, which gives us our problem. We've got big data. Um, not a particularly difficult thing to solve. Just use several machines and spread your data across it, or scaling. Um, if those are hired machines, those are in the cloud. And every solution opens up the next problem. So once you decide to use two machines or three machines to store your data, uh, how exactly do you decide? How? Well, two ways, really. Um, you do what's called sharding, slicing. That's slices of meat. So you somehow partition your data, and you might also do a bit of replication. You might have the same data in multiple places. So generally, you do a bit of both. But really, the scaling comes from the slicing. You can put some data here, and some data here, and some data here, and some data here, and ultimately end up with more data um, than you could store in one place. 
I redid those pictures. This was last night's dinner. So there was some Serbian meats, nicely sliced on multiple plates. So we can increase capacity by adding more plates. It's as easy as that. So do both. Uh, a quick word about Hazelcast, because we'll see that um, in action. Hazelcast is who I work for. It's on my t-shirt. Um, if you've not heard of us, we do two things. Hazelcast in-memory data grid uh, at the bottom and Hazelcast jet at the top. So, um, and I'll flip them around because we're going to talk about the in-memory data grid because this is doing data storage. JET is about processing it as a stream as it comes through. So if you think storage before processing is the data grid, processing before storage is the uh, JET engine. Then Hazelcast is a company. We've been around uh, coming up for 10 years now. We're based out of uh, Palo Alto in California. As I mentioned, I'm based out of London. And the important thing is the software is free. You can download it. You can contribute on GitHub. Uh, there are commercial extensions that will sell if that's what you want. But what does it mean today? This is Hazelcast in my mind. We have four boxes, four machines. Actually, they're JVMs for Hazelcast. So we have four JVMs containing seven light-colored boxes in which I've put playing cards. So what we have in box number zero, because we count from zero, box number zero has got no data in it, box number one, what's that, three of hearts, and so on. And what we see is that my playing cards are spread across the available JVMs. I've got four JVMs, I've not got all 52 cards because data gets added, inserted, deleted. And in dark green at the bottom, I have a bit of replication going on as well. Uh, because if you put data in a JVM, yes, you can access it quickly because it's memory. But you might be concerned about failure, so you have a duplicate copy, a mirror copy. Um, mirror copies are, are kind of my thing. I've got a bottle of water. I have another bottle of water. I've got another laptop. You know, I, I've got reserves. You've got to have spare. So the idea is my Hazelcast grid is a collection of JVMs that uh, talk to each other, share data. They share the load of the data and processing as well, if you want to do that. And you have a client process that can connect. Uh, in fact, for efficiency, it connects to uh, all of them, opens um, multiple sockets. And you can retrieve your data, your prices, or whatever it is you're interested in. It doesn't have to be Java, of course. You can connect uh, from other languages. .NET is a very common one. Node.js is coming very popular recently. And in fact, we have eight languages at the moment. You can write your own if you want. There's a client-server protocol. But today, we're not interested. We can close the other ones down. Windows always takes a while. Today, we're going to talk about Java. So that was a cheap jibe at Windows people. So um, back to my time series database. I'm uh, sorry, my time series data. Time series, I've got things, I've got gold, I've got silver, I've got platinum, I've got palladium, just those four today to keep things simple. And I've got a date, a date stamp. Today, yesterday, the day before, uh, that's my generated test data. But it could be per minute, per hour, whatever. So how do I store that data in a collection of processes effectively? Because I want to get that data out. I want to get it out quickly because speed is important for most applications. Poor response from a website, eh, go to your competitor. So even if you're not doing high-speed processing, you want high reactivity. So this is uh, really how you should think of a data grid the filing cabinet. So the idea is not so much that um, you know where each individual record is, because keeping track of that is just not feasible. There's too many of them. This is big data. You have a partitioning strategy. You have a way of saying, this item, well, it's going to go there if it's anywhere. So I can directly connect to the correct machine, because I know where it will be. 
So if you imagine filing cabinets in an office and we have three of them, you have um, little folders for all the A's, all the B's, all the C's, and this filing cabinet everybody knows has A to H, and this one has I to P, and this one has Q to Z. So if you add another filing cabinet, you've got to move the folders about. That's the scaling. If you've got lots and lots of data, you need more filing cabinets. You can change that number. But the important part is that kind of level of indirection. You know my name, Neil Stevenson, ah, it begins with S, I'll be in this folder, this folder is on that server. We can quickly locate my data record amongst multiple data records amongst multiple servers. That's the, the efficiency part. So uh, from a technical level, this is Java code. My class has got um, a string key, gold, a date, the 19th of October. And what we do is we just take that as a collection, uh, gold, 1, 9, 10, 2018, or whatever. We can generate a hash code from that simple number. And then we divide, modulus that by the number of partitions. So S is letter, uh, what is it? Letter 20 in the alphabet. I'm in the 20th partition. That's the, the kind of idea. The problem is uh, the alphabet doesn't work that way. You know, there's lots of people. S is a very popular. I'm good with that. But other letters, less so. You know, so there's a variation. So maybe that's not a great data uh, partitioning strategy. Maybe it is. It just kind of depends. Uh, before I go on, just a, a tiny little mention there for the word serializable. Uh, it's a data grid. You've got to move data from place to place. So you have to have a way of flattening it out, serializing it, and rehydrating it, deserializing it. Uh, that's just one of the ways Java I.O. serializable, just because it's the least amount of typing for my slides. More realistically, what you might be interested in is a partitioning strategy. You can take control and say, I want to know what piece of data is going where. Uh, so what I'm going to do, so the key of my data record is still those two items, gold and the 19th of October. Instead of using the, both of those to decide where that record goes, I'll say, well, just the 19th of October. So the 19th of October record for gold goes on server one. The 19th October record for Platinum goes on server one. The 19th October record for uh, Palladium goes on server one. All the 19th data goes on the one server. All the 18th perhaps goes on a different server. So the data moves together based on that key. Now, that's important because if you want to say what's today's prices, all those prices are together. So you don't have to cross from machine to machine to retrieve your data. And that gives you speed. Um, that's just one way. More realistically, we'd be interested in the price of gold on the 19th versus the price of silver. Nah. More realistically, you're interested in the price of gold on the 19th versus the 18th. So what you can do is change your algorithm and say, well, now let's make partitioning placement based uh, on gold or on silver. All the gold records go together, all the silver records go together. Uh, in fact, I'm just doing a substring, so just the first letter. So that's bad because all the golds will go together, all the silvers will go together. Platinum and palladium both begin with P, so those records, twice as many are kept together. So if you take control of the algorithm, you can mess it up. I've got gold, silver, platinum, palladium, all the golds go here, all the silvers go here. Platinum, palladium, both go to the same place. So I've got twice as much data uh, that I'm routing to the one place. So I'm going to misbalance my cluster. So it's almost time for uh, a demo because we want to see this actually happening now. I've got my code set up. You can download it at the end. I'll give you the link. It's on the last slide, in fact. So what we're interested in is partitioning and scaling. So we can partition data. We can let the system determine how it splits things up. That was data model one. We can take control and do it various ways that suit us. 
using our skill and judgment, and if you get it wrong, you're making it worse for yourself, not better. So that's scaling. That's how you scale your data. Uh, second part, in the cloud. Um, what does that mean? Well, really, cloud means someone else's machines, and generally, cloud machines are allocated um, at runtime. So you don't know where they are in advance. The demonstration I'm going to do, it's based on AWS, but it could be Azure, GCP, doesn't matter. That gives us a complication uh, because if this is a, a collection of processes that are clustered together, how do they find each other? Ordinarily, you would say, you know, here's the IP address of my friends, and you connect up that way. You know, server A is here, server B is here. You tell server A where server B is. Uh, unfortunately, you don't know how to do that in the cloud because you don't know where they are themselves. Uh, it's not particularly difficult. It's just an irritation. Uh, all the cloud providers have a, some sort of service that will tell you where your servers are. So you give it a tag, Hazelcast Production, you get back a list of IP addresses. Uh, so we have plugins for Zookeeper, Eureka, Console, Kubernetes, Cloud Foundry. You know, they all do it differently, but fundamentally it's the same problem. Just give me a list of IP addresses. The second part about the cloud um, that you've got to be a bit more careful about is where actually are these servers? So it's bad enough that you didn't know where they were in advance, but you actually really kind of need to know where they are at some point in time. So if you imagine this is my data grid, these are my four JVMs. Um, I mentioned about the backup copies. You can have some mirroring. The default is one. Put a piece of data here, put the backup copy on another JVM. So light green at the top, I have seven containers for my playing cards. Uh, where am I? This one. We have some sort of mishap, uh, power failure, who knows what. It's taken out one of my JVMs. So what I've lost is my primary piece of data. I still have my backup. Uh, and all I do, I don't know if you could see that animation, but the, there was a dark green box that says I'm a backup. It now becomes the master copy. We haven't actually lost any data because we lost one JVM, we lost one host machine, uh, but we had others. The danger is those other machines might be somehow connected. They might be on the same power supply. They might be in the same um, machine rack. Uh, and that's a thing that's normally hidden for you by cloud providers, by any kind of virtualization. So you need some sort of affinity mechanism that says that if you put your master copy in north, your backup copy can go in southeast or west, somewhere else. That's the safety. And the further away you put it, the better in terms of safety and the worse in terms of performance. So there's a bit of a balancing act. If you update a piece of data and you have a backup, then you've got to update the backup. If the backup's too far away, then the whole update cycle takes too long. So you kind of want them some sort of balancing act. Far away, but close together. Near enough to be fast. So um, you're probably going to want mirror copies. You can turn that off. You can have no backup copies if you like. If this was something like HTTP sessions and you had no backup copies, if you lost a machine in that state of four, you've lost one quarter of the logins, a quarter of the people are logged out. Um, it's not catastrophic. Uh, it's not good user experience either. So it's a configurable, you can decide. But it comes down to you need to know something about the underlying infrastructure. How separate are the machines really? They're virtual machines. Two virtual machines might be the same physical machine. So if that machine fails, it takes out two virtual machines, and that's half your cluster gone. It's robust against failure up to a point. You can't take away everything. So demo time. Demo time. We've got 15 minutes to go. So let's hope my demonstration works. I've got two. One running on um, Cloud Foundry. 
And what I'll do is I'll start my scaling command. So what I'm changing on Cloud Foundry, hope you can see that the letters, is um, change from three processes to five processes. Cloud Foundry takes a configuration file, uh, just a bit of JSON. And if I go to the web, can we see this clearly? Yes, we can. Look at that. Um, I'm a back-end developer. I wrote this front-end. It's not great. You know? Don't shoot me for it. That's not my job. But if we look, we can see that this process is connected to three machines. I have kicked off a scaling command. And if I look at my service, then what I should see is update in progress. Update in progress. So we'll check back on this one later because this is the first thing that you don't immediately get is that what's happening is Cloud Foundry's, uh, I've said I have three servers and I want five. So Cloud Foundry is talking to AWS and saying, spin me up two more machines. And this takes time. You know, it takes time to spin up a virtual machine. And then it's a data container, so it's no good without data. We've then got to spread all the data back across the machines once the machines are up and ready. So the idea of scaling data is much more controlled than scaling processing. You know, if you were a web service uh, and it's Cyber Monday, you're expecting huge amounts of traffic, you would scale up on the Sunday at the very latest. You want to be ready in advance because the scaling machines takes time. It takes time to move the data from place to place. Uh, and you don't want to do that at a busy time because the machines are busy. Don't give them anything extra to do. Anybody with a browser can try this as well. Let's see what's happening. So uh, I can look at my data. I can see which partitions uh, my gold and silver are on. Let's make this a little bit bigger. So gold is hosted on uh, partition 197, 271 by default. You can change the number of slices. And it's sitting across two members. So it's on one and there's a backup on another. That's how I had it configured. If I look at uh, one of the other examples, this is version two of the code. Um, it's the same thing, but now it's stored by date. So all the golds, uh, sorry, all the 19ths are on one server, all the 18ths are on another, and all the 17ths are on another. So it's spread by date. So I'm using three servers, but they're all in the same partition. And if I look at uh, the last one, then this is storing all the golds together, storing all the platinums together, storing all the palladiums together. So they're all nicely clustered. So I'll do the same thing, because this will take a minute or two. Let's see how my connection is going. I had three to begin with. And I've now got four. I'm scaling up. It'll get to five. Um, so now to see scale up, the other side is scale down. Scale down um, here, I'm now running on Kubernetes. This is not on the web, this is running on my MacBook. Uh, and this is too much for my MacBook, really. Um, so I am running things that are in crash backup loop. So basically, my MacBook doesn't have enough power to run all the things I'm trying to do today, which is PowerPoint and my IDE. So maybe if I shut my IDE down, that'll help. Before we do, this is the code. As I mentioned, I'll put up a download page at the end. You can see this is how I'm doing. Uh, so this is my basic key. Uh, it's comparable as well, so I can print it out. But fundamentally, it's just an item uh, and a date. And then I might extend that key to add this partition awareness and doing it by date. Or I might extend the key and add the partition awareness and doing it by string. So you can change the algorithm if you know what you're doing. And if you get it wrong, um, it makes things worse, not better. So a little bit of guidance is needed. 
So let's see what Kubernetes is doing. Okay, so what Kubernetes will do is if there's a, a failing process, it will restart it. Uh, but what I need to do is, I can never remember the command. So in Kubernetes, the command is uh, stateful sets. How many processes do I have in Kubernetes? I've got a stateful set where the desired number is two uh, and the current number is two. So I've got what I requested. And what I need to do on Kubernetes is scale this. We'll scale it down this time uh, because uh, my machine is overloaded. I can't scale it up. And all I do is tell it what I want to scale it to. Well, type that wrong. Let's see. There we go. So I've asked Kubernetes to scale. And if I repeat this command, it'll probably be too slow and it will have done it. Oh, no. So right now we have one is the desired number, two is what's running. So Kubernetes will kill one of the things off. Hazelcast will notice it gone, rearrange the data on the available servers, which in this case is just the one. Uh, let me see what it's doing. Get pods is the command in Kubernetes. So it's in the middle of terminating, shutting it down, winding it down. If you do that in a controlled way, it offloads the data to the other processes so you don't have to worry so much um, about odd messages in the logs and so on. Is it done yet? Is it done yet? No, nope, still terminating. So if I switch to Cloud Foundry, how many machines do we have in Cloud Foundry? We now have five machines in Cloud Foundry. And if I look at my data placement, then all my gold prices are together, all my silver prices are together. We don't really get a good visual of what that looks on my um, web page. Uh, so a little uh, side note, everything is running slowly. If I go and look at, uh, Hazelcast has a monitoring solution that we sell. Uh, I'm just sh showing it here just so you can see that something's actually happening. Have I typed that password in wrong? Looks like I did. P -A -S -S -W. Looking better. Everything's slow today. Oh, I've got caps lock on. Let's maybe. I'll try one more time. So my app is working fine at least. Let's see how my connections are doing. So I've got five server connections, that's fine. Admin. Shouldn't log in as admin, but it's only a demo. This is looking better. I've typed the password incorrectly, I think. No. Nope. Ah. If at first you don't succeed, let's look at the Kubernetes management center. We'll do the same thing there. Password one. So we have one member process. If we look at my map, um, then what we see is we have 1,400 prices. And what I'll try and do now, let me see how many pods have we got. So I need to scale this back up. And what Kubernetes will do is it'll start up another pod for us. So scale up, scale down, rearrange, all happens automatically. If you want it to. So back to almost done. So um, I mentioned the link, github.com. I'm Neil Stevenson. You'll find all my demos there. Um, the thing we have today is called HeapCon. So we've seen a bit of the demo. Uh, sorry, if you want somebody taking a photo. Time for a, a quick summary. Then I'll nip back to the demo and see if that scaling thing has worked. So when you scale, 
the handling of that is automatic. You know, you can scale up and scale down. You can say to your management system, I want six and it goes and sorts it. I want five and it goes and sorts it. Change from five to six, it goes and sorts it. Uh, you might script that really, but it's kind of a, a, not necessarily a reactive thing. If your business is suddenly busy, adding more servers to the data service gives it more work to do to rearrange that data. That rearrangement is automatic. You don't have to worry about that. Finding these machines, ah, it's a bit of a pain, but not the end of the world. It's a plug-in for Kubernetes. You just say, this is my um, service name, and it returns you all the IP addresses associated with that service name. When you create a new server, it registers its IP address against that service name. It's just a lookup. Um, the thing that matters the most is data safety. If you've gone for one plus a backup, two plus a backup, um, then you cannot accommodate failure. You need to know your backups are reasonably safe, far enough away from your master copies. So having said these things are automatic, uh, you can take a bit of control if you want. Um, you can turn off that automatic rebalancing and turn it back on again. Um, because you might be adding lots of servers, you want to say, well, let's wait until everything is up and ready, and then do that rebalance activity. The scaling is based on the key. This key goes here, this key goes there. There's a default algorithm. It's probably going to be right. If you've got specialist use cases, you can override it and say, let's do certain things with certain things. The data safety, all the machines know is the IP addresses. You have to give it a little bit more data. You can say, well, if you're on bare metal, these IP addresses are somehow connected. This machine and this machine share a power supply. So that's not the best place to put the backup copy. It's better than no backup copy at all. But if that power supply fails, it takes out two machines. So you want to say, well, let's put the backup copy somewhere else. So the software can't know these kind of things. You've got to help it there. And any time you're providing the help, uh, you've got the chance you're going to do it wrong. So you do need a little bit of help and uh, guidance. If you've got trouble, you can, uh, I'll send you my email address at the end. You can raise issues on Stack Overflow. You can ask people. You can figure it out. You can read the documentation. Important thing is the safety. You've got to know what you're doing, where you're placing your data. Because if you believe you've got a backup and then you put it somewhere daft, uh, then you don't have what you thought you had. So, um, one minute to go. That's the end of my presentation. Before that, I'll just put one more reference back to my slide deck. Um, sorry, the sample. Neil Stevenson on GitHub, and then you can download it and play with it. Um, uh, at the top, I'm Neil, N-E-I-L, at hazelcast.com. If you've got any difficulties, just drop me a line. So let's go back to the web and see what Kubernetes has done. So Kubernetes, oh, we still only have one server. Is it because my machine is overloaded? It certainly looks like it. Now even the command isn't returning. So I think that's a point to say Kubernetes is dead. Yep, Kubernetes has died on me. Don't try and run these things on a laptop. That's maybe the thing. That's why you need to scale. You cannot overload your machines. More machines might be more cost effective than more CPUs for the one machine. The one machine, if it fails, takes a lot out. So spreading things thin is maybe a better idea than chunking things together. OK, so that's the end. Bang on time. So thank you, everybody. Um, I'll be about for questions. Uh, where are the questions? At the, the, at the behind the stage and um, other than that all I can say is wish you the best if you have uh, any fun with Hazelcast any trouble drop me a line neil at hazelcast.com thank you <laughs>